Nearly 400 scientists from 45 nations work at the Max Planck Institute of Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics in Dresden. Each and every one is asking the same question. How do cells form tissues, and then from there, organisms? For their research, the scientists work with various model organisms. These include nematode worms, zebrafish, mice, two types of yeast, the budding yeast and the fission yeast, and fruit flies. The blueprint of zebrafish and humans is comparable. Both need the spine as a stabilizer and as a starting point for the musculoskeletal system. But how is the spine formed in early embryonic development? What aspects of their origin can we transfer to higher vertebrates than humans? At the Institute, the basics of cell division are explored with the help of nematode worms. The question is, when do things go wrong here and why? Like the uncontrollable cell division in cancer. The cell consists of many, many different machines. And if we study how each one works and put them all together, we can understand how the cell itself functions. I, for instance, work on the process of cell division, in which one cell divides into two. But despite the fundamental importance of this process in life, we still don't understand how it works. The oscillation of cell nuclei in fission yeast during cell division is crucial for creating genetic diversity in the sex cells. During the oscillation, the sister chromosomes come together and exchange genetic information. The movement is driven by motor proteins, which were observed for the first time in living cells at the Institute. Motor proteins are tiny molecules that transform the energy of the cell into mechanical work. These motion systems, microtubules, can even be placed in artificial systems, such as silicon chips. We're interested in motor proteins because they move organelles and other sort, small structures around inside of cells. For example, they move the chromosomes during cell division and they move the transmitter-containing vesicles in neurons. Now, they're important because defects in motor proteins can give rise to um, problems such as infertility and also neurological disorders. And they're also interesting from a from a an engineering point of view because these very small motors may have interesting nanotechnological uh, applications. The genetic eye disease retinitis pigmentosa is being studied using the model organism Drosophila melanogaster. For this study, the researchers are looking at genes that are responsible for the polarity of epithelial cells. These genes are also needed for the development of the eye of a fly. If a gene is missing, the photoreceptor cells die and the fly goes blind. In humans, the process is similar. This research could form the basis for new therapies. Well, there are two approaches that are currently um, performed. One is the gene therapy, and in this approach, a, an intact gene is taken and uh, um, put into the defective photoreceptor cell and replaces the defective gene. The other approach is the um, stem cell um, therapy. In this case, an intact cell from an, a healthy individuum is taken and transplanted into the diseased retina, and in this case, then the intact cell should take over the function of the cell, of the photoreceptor cell that is undergoing um, cell death. Genes determine the size of the human brain. In essence, it depends on the number and type of cell divisions of neural stem cells and progenitor cells that produce neurons. It is here that there are fundamental differences between mice and humans. The larger the brain, the more efficiently the space available for stem and precursor cell divisions is exploited. A fundamental feature of humans is their big brain. Brains get bigger when, during development, neural stem cells divide more often. We study the underlying genes and have already elucidated the cell biological mechanism, how some of them function in stem cell divisions. The entire human genome has been decoded. 
However, its functions are still largely unexplored. With the most modern technical methods, the scientists at the Institute have conducted genome-wide endocytosis screens. The endosomes found were then analyzed and mapped. Using special software, these images have been converted into data files. So my group focuses on understanding how different parts of a complex system function when they are put together. And a human being is an example of a complex system because it's more than the sum of its parts. And in particular in my group, we try to understand how the membrane system functions together with the signaling system in order to provide the ability of the cells to respond to the different stimuli in the way they respond. And we hope that the knowledge from this uh, mechanism will give us uh, new insight into development of novel therapies to treat human diseases. With the help of high content screening, 40,000 potential ingredients for medicines are being examined at the Institute. Studying how the different parts function and how they, when put together, collectively contribute to the behavior of a complex system such as a human being may provide us new opportunities to discover better methods for treating disease. For example, we are screening for new drugs in cell-based assays that better mimic human physiology than the screening technologies typically used in the pharmaceutical sector. By so doing, we hope to help find drugs that are both better at treating disease as well as those that cause fewer side effects. Successful research through collaboration. High performance computing at the Technical University of Dresden has evaluated the results of the endocytosis screens. There is also close collaboration with the Medical Theoretical Center and the Biotechnology Center of the University, as well as the Max Planck Institute for the Physics of Complex Systems. This broad network strengthens the overall scientific hub of Dresden. The Max Planck Institute of Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics in Dresden developed a model that promotes personal strengths. Scientific teams conduct research on an equal footing with flat hierarchies in an interactive network. The institution determines the direction of the faculty. This body makes critical decisions jointly with representatives of all employees and directors. More than half of the scientists at the institute are doctoral students and postdoctoral researchers and the average age is just 31. In the graduate school, there are 150 PhD students from over 30 countries. It is the largest doctoral program in Germany. The institute, however, not only supports young researchers, but also young scientists and their families. Children are not seen as obstacles to one's career. Indeed, some of them are probably already on their way to being the young scientists of tomorrow as their parents are creating the foundations of new treatments and advanced nanotechnologies today.